and I will uh, highlight me so we can see what's going on. All right, so when somebody said minnows and, and then suggested clouds or minnow, I figured that'd be a good thing to start with for me. Uh, I, as I've noted before, uh, the club in Edmonton used to go to Calgary for the fly fishing show and we'd run a kid's tying thing. Uh, well, one year Bob Clauser was there and he was parked in the booth next to us. So he uh, spent some time and showed us how to tie a proper Clauser minnow. So the tips that I'm going to show you are the things that uh, we learned from him. So I've got a, a size eight hook about 3x long you can tie them on shorter but you have to adjust the position of the eyes on the shank a little bit for the shorter hooks so for this one we'll start right behind the eye and i will wrap down <clears throat> the shank of the hook holding up that tip and i'll get down to part way down the shank it looks like about a quarter there and the space between the eye of the hook and where you put the eyes on is critical for how you make the nose of this pattern. So I measure the width of the eyes from the back of the eye to where I'm going to stop my thread. And that's the width of the eyes. So right there is where I'm going to stop my thread. And to put the eyes on, what I'm going to do is wrap a big bump of thread. So you can see I'm making a lump of thread right there. Good size lump. And this is the trick to keep, one of the tricks to keep the eyes from twisting around the shank. So then I take my dumbbell eyes and, and these are just a, a regular, a regular dumbbell eye, except these ones have a little flat uh, recess in it that you just put a little sticky pupil and I like you can you can get them that are just regular eyes that have are colored colored red I like red eyes or some of them come with a red eye on them already these little stick on eye ones are pretty good so what I do is I place the eyes across the hook and push it up till it just bumps into the thread in the behind the, th the bump and I'll do three or four wraps like that. And then I'll go under the hook and wrap from front to back behind three or four wraps and hold them in place. Now you see, there's there I've got them sitting on top. And, and at this point, they will still rotate a little bit. So I keep going from back to front diagonally and I'll go eight or 10 wraps. Then I'll go the other way, eight or 10 wraps. And that actually makes them pretty secure. Some guys go around and under like this, but I don't do that because it's not necessary. But what I do do is I take my super glue and I just take a teeny little Bit of super glue and put it on the thread. And then I'll just give it a couple of wraps. And from that point, those eyes aren't going to. And I'm, I'm going to use some uh, similar glue a little bit later. So now I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to bring it forward of the eyes about a third of the distance between the eye of the hook and where the eyeballs are. So you can see I'm maybe a little less, maybe a quarter of the way. And that's where I'm going to start tying my bucktail. And I'm going to do this with the bucktail. You can do it with, with, uh, with polar bear. So I want on these, I want them fairly long. I like these ones, these uh, the ones that I use fairly long. So I've got a bucktail here that, that has, it's the full bucktail. And so it's got some really long fibers. 
What I want to do is I want to pick some fibers that have a good amount of length to them. And how many, how much to pick up? Well, I'm going to measure again, use the hook to measure. I'm going to take this batch here. And I'm going to measure just about a gap width. So that's that's close. Get a little more. Because this stuff at the ends will thin out. So when you pull it up and hold it flat, that's hold it flat, that's about a gap width. Halfway down. And I want as much length as I can get. So I go right down to the to the base of the hide and clip that all off right as close as I can get. I have a bunch of bucktail. Now, one of the things you want, you'll, you'll notice that it's really sparse at the tips and thicker at the bottom. And that's because there's a bunch of fuzz down here and it's irregular in length. So I hold it, this bunch gently by the bottom and then I will take the long, long bits that stick outside the clump and I'll gently pull them out. And I will line that up with the rest by hand. That, I just need to do that once. As you see, you're going to end up with bits of bucktail all over the floor. Then I take my comb, hold the tips, get my waste basket under here so you know, everything's on the floor. And I will comb out the fuzz. Then my hair stacker, and I will, uh, I still have a lot of these, these long, long pointy bits. I'm just going to ease them out by grabbing on them, pull them out, and then pull them back so the tips line up a little bit. There's a couple there I don't want. So I get the tips evened up a little bit, and then I put them in the hair stacker. and get them down in there, tap them down a bit at the butts. Load down the air stacker to try and separate them out a bit so that they'll stack nice. And then I'll pack them a bit. Take them out of the stacker. And I have this clump of bucktail. So now what I want to do is measure for length. And I'll take the bulk of that tail, measure the shank of the hook, grab it with the right hand, slide it back to where the bend is. And that gives me the shank of the hook length, which is about a 4x four, four long, behind the hook. And I'll get that back there as far as I can reasonably get. And I'll hold that clump of deer hair with thumb and forefinger of my right hand right where the eye of the hook is. So that's the right length. I'll bring my left hand in and grab that clump of deer hair right where the eyes are and hold it like that. Flatten it out a little bit. Take my scissors and I'm going to trim them just about a quarter inch in front of where my fingers are. Let's see if I can hold this up so you can see. And I'll cut it square, straight across. And you see how it's now flattened out a bit and it's all nice and even at the end. And I've got that quarter inch sticking out. I place my hands over top of the eyes at about a 45 degree angle with the front of that clump right where the eye of the hook is. Bring a loose wrap up right in front of the eyes and underneath and then pull up. And you'll see that pulls that whole clump down on top of the hook so that the edge of that clump is right behind the eye. And, and then I'm gonna do that again. 
in behind, in behind, and then gradually wrap forward. My oh, hooks, my vice just let go, rats. I gotta start that again. My vice slipped. Hang on a sec. Because I gotta pre provide quite a bit of pressure on this to make it sit properly. Even it up again. So there we are. Oh, for crying out loud, why is my face not working today? Oh, well, use a little less force. Okay. Pull it down. There we go. It, and that's it's effective, it. Dave. You have to go buy a new vice. Nah, yeah. Okay. I just was pulling too hard. Okay. So now I wrap it down in this little pointy bit right behind the eyes, right in front of the eyes, all the way down to the eye of the hook. Then I bring back and I run my thread underneath the eyes on the near side and over the top and pull the, the material down behind the eye, right behind the eyes. So at this point, I wanna keep this white material on top of the hook chain. So I'll hold them up at an angle and I'll wrap my thread down, gently pulling that down on top of the hook. And I'll wrap right back to where the point of the, where the barb of the hook was. I'll switch hands and put the thread right up in behind, pull it forward, wrap in front. Another one in behind where the hair is held up and then wrap down in front. And you'll see what that does is that, let me adjust this vice again. There we go, there we go. You see what that does is that keeps the, the tail from going down when you wrap it on the hook shank. It keeps that tail sticking up a bit at the back. So now I can come back up and cinch this down all the way up to behind the eyes and then underneath again and in front. Make sure that that nose is good. Then I turn the, the entire hook upside down. Because this is the way, the way the fish, the fly is fished. It, because of the weight of the eyes, it flips it over. So now we're gonna, that's why we're using white. That's the belly of the fly. And now we're gonna use chartreuse for the, the underside. But before I do that, I'm gonna add a little bit of flash. So I've got some of this mixed gold and silver uh, holographic fly flash. And it's, uh, it's quite, quite thin and shiny. And I will pull out of the package. I'll try to get three or four strands. I cut a little slip slit in the package and then get in underneath and then pull out the ones I want. So I got three or four full length. I'll uh, turn that off. And that way I don't have to take all the flash out of the package. And what I do with this is I will bend it in the middle, wrap it around the thread half on each side, and I'll bring it up and cinch it down on top of the fly between the eyes. I'll take half of them on the right side and half of them on the left side of the eyes, and then wrap right back to where the eyes are. I don't wanna go past that. I want them to sort of stick there on top of the eyes, two on either side or two on the other side, and uh, then I'll grab the ends out here and trim them to length, take them off to the side so I'm not cutting the hair. And I will cut them off roughly the length of the hair. There we go. Guys. So they just hang there. I want, I, want, I want them to be as flexible as possible. Now I got my, my green body. So I'm going to do the same thing here. 
This is a, a chartreuse bucktail. I'll measure again up against the gap of the hook. Get right down on the bottom. Right down to the head hide. And trim it off. It's snug to the tie. And this is going to be a little bit chunkier than the than the top. I'll thin it out just a bit. Not quite as many. And I'll do the same thing. I'll hold this up to the hook by the butts where I just cut it off the hide. And I'll measure it so it's the same length as the white. And then I'll grab it again right where the eyes are with my left hand. Take them out. And these one, the, I'll just, in order to keep it from getting stuck, I'm just going to take, this is not as fuzzy underneath. I just used my comb to clean it up a bit. And I'll, once again, I'll do this. Let me get here where you can see what I'm doing. I would do this one quarter inch in front of my fingers and cut it square. Then I'll lay this down again in that square. And I'll lay this down at that angle so that the front edge of those fibers are <clears throat> where the eye of the hook is. Bring my thread back just in front of the eyes, hold it down, and start at the back, do a little bit of a snug pull, and then work my way down. Now, if you've managed to get too much out the front, you can always pull the fibers back a little bit so you clear the eye. <clears throat> so I'm going to wrap that down, snug it down. And you'll see I end up with this tapered nose on the fly. That's the trick behind doing that is this holding it at that angle and keeping those short. And I will wrap this really good and solid. Really a reasonable amount of pressure to do it. And I'll make this nose good and solid. And I'm not sure what happened there. There we go. I think I crowded that with a couple of wraps. Need to get it back clear of the eye. And I'll make a, a really good solid head of the fly. I got I got my darn green too far forward, so I'm gonna bring my thread back out of the way. Flip it over and I'm gonna trim that excess green off. Make sure I don't cover the eye eye of the hook, the hole in the eye of the hook with thread. I just got a little bit too big a clump, I think. Anyway, that's the general idea. When I get there, I get my whip finisher. And I wrap a good four wraps or so. Do the same thing. Good and snug. Trim it off. And I'll take my head cement and I will try and get this to soak in through those wraps because they will tend, if you have a big clump of uh, hair, it sometimes they won't, it'll pull out some of the inner clump even though I've done a good job of cutting them at that angle it tends to get all the the butt ends of the hair I want a little bit of uh, glue in there so that they don't pull out <clears throat> from the back 
and th and that's him. That's your Klauser minnow. So I'll just really quickly uh, put this on a, so you can see it there. So you can see how the the head looks. So I'll get you another one. That's that one is bucktail. This one used polar bear. And that one's this one's a little sparser. You can tie them fat or or sparse. And I tend to like them generally a little bit more sparse. And if you really want to have a big fat fly, you get a bigger hook and bigger eyes. And this one is tied with bucktail. And this is a size four. It's a short shank hook with bigger eyes. So you can see it's basically the same fly, but it's uh, with that short shank, I have a lot more stuff sticking out the back of the hook. And I think you get the odd short strike with that. Other than that, that's it. That's how you do a closer mint. And I'll drop the highlight uh, right here. Dave. <laughs> yeah. Have He's... you uh, used that for um, any salmon fishing at all? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mohammed, the last time we were up at Hanina, mm -hmm. uh, the, the fish were looking for bucktails, right? Yeah. So we ended up with bucktails. And the way the guys were rigging it, uh, I think it was because the fish were a lot more mobile uh, last year. You know, there were a lot of fish. And they were in schools and they were moving around a lot. Yeah. But I know, I know the first couple of years that I was up there, we were actually casting Clouser minnows uh when we were anchored up off the kelp beds yeah and, and that's a whole passel of fun but mm. the but when you and i were up there last time they were in moving schools and they were they weren't hanging around the kelp beds so much mm -hmm. so we ended up with bucktails and we used that rig where you take you take the bucktail and then you'd put like four little plastic beads here yep and then a clevis with a little spinner that's right. And, and so you'd have this this uh, beads and then the spinner in front of it with a bucktail. And and that was really effective, as you remember. Yep. And and last year we did that a bit. Not so much. They they weren't really active on, on flies last year, uh, except for a couple of afternoons. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I actually got Joe actually and his son actually caught their first uh, coho on a fly rod. <laughs> Ah, okay. And and we were pulling bucktails at that time, but well, the clousers okay. clousers worked just as well. What yeah. we were what the the first few years I was up there, there were a lot of kelp beds, yeah. more so than we were last year, and so we would anchor on the kelp beds, and we would just cast into the current that was going between the kelp beds or around the edge of the points and stuff, yeah. and we just cast clousers and then cast them out as far as we could and then strip them back in, and uh, we did real well. Mm -hmm. uh, Cloud, there, it's a very effective pattern. Almost any species of, of fish, I think, clousers. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, even in uh, in smaller sizes, they're great in uh, in streams and rivers. Uh, yeah. As well. So, and last year, did you use the uh, use the fish skull bucktails uh, more? Yes, so? I did. Yeah, yeah, I tied those instead of as a uh, uh, instead of using dumbbell eyes, I used the fish skulls. Yeah. And, uh, Basically the same tie, you, you're doing it, uh, you know, a top and bottom of, of uh, white or light color and then a darker top uh, and maybe some pinks and some purples and stuff like that. Just yep. you need a little variety. That's right. And with a little spinner in front. And and those work really well trolled. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're harder to cast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So if we get an opportunity, so Mohammed, this year, if we get an opportunity to anchor up off the kelp beds at Kelp Point or off Holiday Island there, yeah, we'll put some buck, we'll put some clousers on and we'll try casting to them. Yeah, that's right. Clousers are super effective. Yep. Yeah. The the uh Bob Bob Clouser himself, he lives uh at a uh, same sort of style, but a little yeah. more sparse. But, yes. You know. He, he lives at a uh, a place just outside Oklahoma City. Uh, and he he's a bass fisherman to start with. 
Mm-hmm. And he uses them for bass fishing. He also developed them, what he calls the deep clauser with the heavy bucktails, because he would rake, make regular trips down to Florida to fish for uh, for bonefish and for tarpon and, and stuff like that using clauser minnows. Uh, and so his, his fly became very popular any place where you need a minnow pattern. Uh, they work really well. <laughs> we used them in the Rotorua Lakes in, in New Zealand. Uh, they, there, there the trick was to cast out as far as you could. You'd anchor up on the drop-off, cast them out as far as they could, let them sink right down to the bottom, and then re-slow retrieve up the slope. And then when you got them to where the 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 line was hanging straight down, you'd stop and you'd sit there and on the hang. And quite often a fish would take it on the hang. It, it'd stop moving and it'd be hanging straight down. And then you'd, you'd feel the rod tip go down and bang, you, you'd get a fish. Uh, so they're effective in a number of ways, a number of different techniques. It's a, it's a everybody should have clousers in their box for sure. Okay. Yeah. We bring in a couple for Ian to look at because it was he it was he who asked for uh, a yes. streamer. Okay. I will I will do that, but not on Tuesday. Um, my wife and I get on the ferry. We're heading to uh, Seattle on Tuesday morning. Uh, we're going going with friends to uh, attend the annual spring flower show in Seattle. Oh. I guess it's a big woo. There's, you know, hundreds of hundreds of exhibitors and stuff. Uh, so our friends are our gardeners and uh, we're all going down to see what's what's there. Okay. So Florin a... is up. Where is Florin? Uh, he's there. Maybe he's gone for a coffee or something. <laughs> <laughs> There he is. Oh, okay. Go anywhere. Uh, he was just getting his, his fancy uh, <clears throat> camera. Okay. So um, I'm I'm working here on the assumption that um, everybody knows the rolled muddler. Nice shirt, Florin. And. Um, so I wasn't going to do a basic version. I thought, since you guys presumably know the rolled muddler, I'm going to look out for variations. Mm-hmm. And I found some variations, but I didn't find um, the exact recipes or very good pictures of them either. Uh, one of them was called a green flash muddler. The other one, I think, was called a chartreuse muddler. And it looked like some combination of using some green flash and using uh, some chartreuse deer hair. And also, I suspect some form of bright green uh, dyed mallard flank. So what I did is I, I looked around for what materials I had. And um, here's what I came up with. Now, the size that was recommended was a size 8. Um, and my hooks are of the shorter shank variety. And looking at the pictures, it looks like those were tied on slightly longer shank hooks. So then I went to a size six. These are all sourced from uh, from trout bum. And these are the size six hook. And this is what I'm tying on today. And I also tied a few on this smaller size eight, which to, to me, would match a size 10 in a different style, longer shank hook, okay? Uh, but at the end of the day, I'd like to get my hands on one of these uh, actual samples and see exactly how long they are because I tie in proportion to the size of the hook. Um, measuring those things, they're about between an inch and an inch and a quarter length in total. The beads are lightweight, actually. They're uh, just, there for, for color, not so much for weight. These are 7 64th of an inch of uh, gold colored brass beads instead of tungsten. But of course, you can go 1 8th of an inch uh, and tungsten, and then these things are going to go down like anvils. Um, but maybe that's not what you want. 
<laughs> and then for the flash material, so otherwise um, I found I had some uh, dyed mallard, which was kind of um, yellowish. It's not quite chartreuse, unfortunately, but I thought, okay, fine enough. It's, it's close enough. And then for flash, I tried different things. I have um, crystal flash that's um, sort of a pearl dyed chartreuse. Then I have some um, other stuff, which is uh, more like this polar flash material, which is just pearl. And that reflects all sorts of colors. So I think this should work well as well. And then I have um, this polar flash, which is a mixture of green, silver, a bit of gold, it's, it's a bunch of colors mixed in here. And it's also very, 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 very soft. And I, for streamers, I prefer these things, you know, you take it in hand and it's really, really soft. There's, there's hardly any, any stiffness to it. And this is particularly important, I think, when you're doing things in, in what I consider to be a smaller size like this one. Because with these other materials, even flashable in shorter lengths, tends to behave more like a stiff, mm -hmm. stiff material. So if you don't want broomstick-like behavior, um, I think it's better to go to one of these softer, softer materials. Okay, enough talking, and let's see how it's done. It's actually a relatively simple fly, albeit a little bit, um, a little bit messy. I'm using some. Uh, ah, speak of. See, that's no good. Having ice problems. That's just a slight adjustment to the tension. The jaws should fix that. So I don't want to over tighten my jaws either because that wrecks the jaws. It's not going anywhere anymore. So I'm using some relatively fine red thread like an eight aught or similar thread. And that's in order not to create bulk, which makes both underbodies and the heads uh, not very nice looking. So go to the, the point where you crush the barb, the hook, and that's where you put the tail on. And I have a bit of, um, I have a few bits here of mallard feather left. And you know, the tail length is kind of the usual, roughly one third to one half of body length. And this one is maybe a little too long. You can always, if you just do a couple of turns of thread, you can always pull on the feather and readjust the length. Okay, this is good enough. I can trim this here. I leave a little bit of a piece there so I get a smoother transition in the body. And then I still had some, some fibers from when I pulled the, the last clump of fibers for, for a tail. So I'm just going to stack those on top here and just put them on. I'm going back. And that's my tail. I'll trim this off. And then I'm going to use a little bit of wire for ribbing. I just like to have, um, some people like to double wrap their, their tinsel body and put a layer of super glue in between. I'm not that fond of super glue as a material for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I don't, I don't use that. And instead what I do is I, um, I reinforce my bodies with wire. And this is uh, medium uni French wire in silver. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap a full length of wire all the way down the hook to the head. I should have done it a bit more evenly than this, but this will work. And then 
starting now from the head of the fly, I'm going to take some tinsel. This is also uni. Um, and it's the uh, mylar gold silver. Size 12 is about as big as you want to um, to go on size six and eight hooks. Um, if you go to smaller hooks, definitely 14. If you're double wrapping, size 12 is almost too big. Uh, size 10 is, is simply huge. It's, it's really hard to wrap uh, uniformly without having ugly gaps. That's really the issue. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look carefully at and find the gold side. And I'm going to attach the mylar at the front of the fly, gold side up. Now you can't see this step very well because I'm holding the mylar on my side of the hook, but I'm just going and wrapping over it with thread all the way to where I tied the tail in. So what this does for me is it gets me a decent, so this is what it looks like. And there's gold side up. Uh, and it's gold side up because I want the silver. You always tie the other side up so that when you wrap, you end up with the side that you want, which in, ca in this case, it's silver. And now what I do is I, I pull out a little bit of uh, length of thread off my bobbin. So I can just use the rotary vise without worrying about anything. So now I start wrapping the tinsel and I do this carefully because if you hit the point of the hook, that can cut your mylar. So just take your time. That's the beauty of using a rotary vise. It lets you do these things nicely and evenly. You get to the head. You need to leave some room here about the same width as the bead size because you we need to build up a little head here with stuff and that's where the wing, wing will go as well. So again, lengthen the thread a little bit more so I can do the ribbing the same way. So keep this under, under tension and at an angle, and then the ribbing is gonna come out nice and even. There you go. Stop here. Then just helicopter the wire. You go. Now we have a ribbed body and we need to start building a wing. Now the wing is going to be built out of the same color mallard that I use for the tail. And what I'm doing is I'm sorting. What I do is I buy a whole pack of mallard. So I think it came in a packet like this. And it's all a bunch of feathers mixed in there. So what I do is I take the vacuum cleaner and put it next to my desk. And I clear off the desk and I empty the whole packet on the desk. And I strip the fuzz from all the feathers. So I leave the feathers clean and ready to use. That's number one. And while I'm doing this, I'm also sorting out the feathers into sizes. So what you can see here are the large and medium sizes. The, the medium sizes are in a small Ziploc bag that's inside the bigger Ziploc bag, and the big feathers are just loose in the bigger bag. And then I also have a bunch of smaller feathers which are stored separately because those would be used in dry flies and stuff like that. Okay? So this helps, and... In this particular case, I had one of the medium size feathers that I'm using for tails because I don't need very long fibers and one of the larger feathers that I'm using for wings where I need longer fibers. Okay. So it makes life a little bit easier when you 
when you get started. And you just, you know, get yourself enough feathers for the dozen or two flies that you're going to be tying, right? Because you're definitely going to be tying at least a dozen of these at one time, right? So get a, get a clump of fibers here. I don't know, maybe um, three eighths of an inch or so of the, of the feather, just kind of eyeball it to whatever you feel would be a, a good amount. And then these are, you pull them off the feather with the tips as even as you can, and then roll them a little bit between your fingers so they don't all point in one direction only. Okay. I don't know if the name rolled muddler comes from this or from something else, I have no idea but this is one good thing to do. And then line up with the tips of the tails, hold it on top and give it a few solid turns of thread. And there you have a wing. Trim the rest. And now it's time for some flash. Now I've already tied some flies with a bit of that mixed green flash. And what I do is after I tie the fly, I have a, a bit of uh, flash left. I put it in one of these um, bulldog clips, the old fashioned ones. They hold fibers uh, quite, quite well. Um, and I have, I don't know, I don't count them. I just kind of eyeball them. But in this case, I guess I have about five of those fibers that I pulled out. Oh, and there's a stray pearl fiber from when I was showing you the other material. So heck, why not use this as well? I'm just going to put this in here with the others. And now, because I've added this extra fiber, I need to trim the ends even. There you go. All right. Now you've seen uh, Dave's trick to to put in flash, that's a very nice way of, of doing it when you want it uh, nice and even on both sides. Uh, what I'm going to do now is a variation of that idea. So I, I measure the length of the wing and I tie this a little bit to my side. The thread is going to pull it up a little bit towards the, towards the center. I can always manipulate at this stage the flash a little bit more. Another turn or two of just the only difficulty here is to get this stuff out of the way. Okay, and then for the other side, basically pull this over and hold it in whatever position you want it to end up being in. Wrap over it. Measure to length and cut. And well, I still have left for for one fly basically right here. Okay. If you think this is sticking at too many weird angles, hold everything between your thumb and forefinger here and just do a few more more wraps on top, and that's going to gather the fibers and the flash in one bundle nice and even now personally i think you could probably stop here and just fish it but i have no experience with this so i'm going to continue following the recipe next thing is i'm going to get a little bit of deer hair and it's going to be a little bit so i don't know exactly how to tell you this um, I kind of go by feel again. But that's, I'm going to show you the clump of, of hair. That's about as much hair as I'm using. And there's a little bit of fuzz here, which I'm just going to pull out. And this is a little difficult here because it's Edmonton and it's winter. And if there is anything that's reliable here in the winter is it's going to be dry. Now I have one extra hair that sticks out a little too far and I'm just gonna pull it out. Okay. Now, 
what I'll do is I'm going to take this hair and I'm going to measure it on top of the wing that I've built so far. So I get the correct length. And then what I like to do, so here's, you know, the, the fly is perfectly um, straight in the vise. So you can see it well, but I'm looking at it from above. So I like to turn my vise 45 degree angle. And that is one thing I didn't realize how much I'm going to like about this vise when I got it. It's the only rotary vise that I'm aware of, which stops at 45 degree increments. Okay, so a few turns. That will, that will secure my wing. And now what I wanna do is a little unorthodox. I'm going to cut, going to trim here the front like this. I'm going to put the thread through that. That will super secure my wing. And what I'm doing is I'm keeping the leftover hair between my fingers. I'm not throwing this away because this is in fact the nicest part of the hair in terms of that chartreuse coloring. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to turn the hook around in the vise and I'm going to attach bits of this hair to build up that little muddler head. So put a little bit here, a few turns of thread to secure, cut. You can see how this is very nice and chartreuse -y. And then I still have a little bit left of the hair, I'm gonna try to attach one more bit here on the sides, okay? So what I've managed so far, and this may be enough, as you can see, the bottom is fairly clear. I'm gonna cut everything flat on the bottom as it is. And then I have a little bit of chartreuse here on top and on the sides. If you feel that you need more hair, and I'm not feeling that way right now, if you feel you need more hair, cut another clump, throw the tips away and do the same thing. So out of the same length of hair, you can get two or three bits of hair to build around the head here. So I'm going to consider this sufficiently dressed up here. I don't wanna overdress it and just pull these fibers, push them back as much as I can to get them out of the way of the, of the thread. So I can do my whip finish. So at this point, I just whip finish between the, just straight forward basically between the bead and the hair head. One. And this being hair again, I don't like to get glue in there. So two whip finishes and that spot behind the bead tends to be a fairly well protected spot. So I find that usually two whip finishes is all I need. Okay, and this is the 90% completed fly. And all that's left to do now is take the scissors or, or razor if that's your preferred method and from this clean. So first a straight cut on the bottom and then a few more cuts here to trim on the side. And if this is, you know, a little too long on one side, just gather the wing together and snip away without fear of getting rid of your wing in the same the same process. There you go. Trim on that side, maybe a little bit more here. And this has a few more 
deer hairs in the in the wing up top, then it's strictly recommended. But then deer hair is a fairly fragile material. And my suspicion is that should you be lucky enough to have some fish come to this, uh, that'll make this a very good fishable fly after the first couple of fish. And that's uh, that's that. You can vary the materials a little bit. You can probably use natural um, natural mallard as well, uh, because the green flash and and the deer hair would would give this enough of a, enough of a color. And that's the fly.